we will start the, the session on nonlinear and diagnosis uh, in the automatic control. So the first, uh, let me see. The first paper to be presented will be concurrent for fault diagnosis based on an extended camera filter, who will be given by Adrian Rizarraga, uh, Ophelia Begovic, and Antonio Ramirez Treviño. So, uh, please, Adrian, connect your presentation and go ahead. Hello, everyone. Uh, let me share my full screen. Uh, okay. There is. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, can I start? Uh, well, welcome to this session. Uh, that's going to start, sorry, by the delay. But please uh, go ahead with the first uh, session. I think the speaker will be Adrián Lizarraga. Is that right? Yes. OK, please go ahead. OK, go ahead. Antonio, okay. saludos. OK, here, here I am. Hello, everyone. First of all, let me thank you all for coming here today. What I what I like to present to you today is our work concurrent for diagnosis based on an extended Kahneman filter. Uh, the authors of this work are Dr. Ophelia Begovic, Dr. Antonio Ramirez, and me, Adrián Lizarraga. And we are from Simvestad, Guadalajara, Mexico. I've divided my presentation into five main parts. First, the motivation, then the fourth diagnosis with a single observer, followed by a case study, the resource, and finally the conclusions and future work. So, modern industrial processes and automated systems are becoming larger and complex, so the reliability of these systems is critical as system failures compromises the system safety and more important, the human safety. Also, it can cause economic losses. For these reasons, and in order to increase the reliability of the system, a fault diagnosis scheme should be used. So, in order to address the fault diagnosis problem, many works use a bank of observers, which is basically a group of individual observers where each observer is designed for a specific system fault. Also, on each observer, a residual is generated, which are denoted as R, and then the fault detection and isolation are achieved by evaluating the residuals. Moreover, some works even estimate the fault magnitudes by using this scheme. However, one of the main drawbacks of this scheme is that it requires to design one, one observer for every fault. For this reason, is pro in this work is proposed a scheme where the actuator force are diagnosed with just one observer is even when the force occurs simultaneously, where simultaneous force also are known as concurrent force. In addition, for diagnosis, implies for detection, isolation, and estimation. Now, let the model of the system be described by this equation, where the actuator force are represented by these terms, where the R terms are known as force signatures, while the M terms represent the force magnitude. So, in order to diagnose the force of the system with just one observer, we take the original system and then we add to it the four magnitudes as states of this new system. By this manner, this augmented system is obtained. 
Note that since the four magnitudes are states of this augmented system, they can be estimated using uh, a step observer. Moreover, since every four magnitude is related to just one four or a specific four, then the four isolation and detection are achieved too. Also note that by this construction, the force are considered as constants or piecewise constants. And as it will be shown later, this scheme works even when simultaneous force occur. Also in our work, we add the following proposition where we assume that the that the states of the original system are available as output and and then if the rank of these k four signatures equal k then the observability matrix of the augmented system has rank n plus k that is the the augmented system satisfies the observability rank condition Note that the observability matrix of a system is calculated using the lead derivatives. Here, the upper block represents the outputs of the system, and this part represents the derivatives of the outputs. Now, in proposition one, we assume that all the states of the original system are available. That is why this is a diagonal of ones why this block represents or is related with the system force. Then the derivatives of the output are this part, so it can be seen that this matrix will have full rank if the R terms have rank equal to K or if they are, if they are independent. So this proposition is helpful because in order to verify that the augmented system satisfies the observability run condition, we just need to verify that the k earth terms have rank equal to k instead of computing all the observability matrix. Now, a case study will be described. In this work, our prototype is a three-wheel omnidirectional mobile robot which has three omnidirectional wheels, three brushless motors, where every motor has its own driver, a Texas Instruments Delfino microcontroller is used, and an indoor GPS system or beacons are used as sensors. These sensors measure the mobile robot's position and orientation. Now, in order to apply our methodology, we need a model of our system. In this case, we use a kinematic model, which is already expressed in global coordinates. Note that the actuator force are already modeled and the gamma terms are shown here. As states of this system, we have X1, X2, which represent the vehicle's position along the global X and Y axis, and X3 represents the mobile robot's orientation. Next, we need to add the four magnitudes as states of this new system. By doing so, this augmented system is obtained where the available states or output are X1, X2, which represent the mobile robot's position, and X3, which represents the mobile robot's orientation. Note that these states are available due to the GPS system. Moreover, all the states of the original system are outputs of this new system. Therefore, the assumptions of Proposition 1 are satisfied. Hence, instead of computing all the observability matrix, we will verify that the three four signatures have rank equal to three. So let's arrange the four signatures in a matrix form where, where these gamma terms have been shown before. Uh, and now 
this matrix can be expressed as a multiplication of two matrices where this left matrix is a well-known linear map which actually is known as the rotation matrix and this right matrix is also a linear map. Moreover, both matrices have their respective inverse and we know that a linear map is invertible if and only if it is injective and surjective, while injectivity implies that the kernel equals zero. And therefore, the four signatures have rank equal to three. And by proposition one, we conclude that the augmented system satisfies the observability rank condition. So now the experiment resource will be presented where the experiments have been done with real data obtained from our mobile robot prototype. In the first experiment, only one fold has occurred, whereas in the other experiment, simultaneous or concurrent folds have occurred. In both experiments, an extended Kalman filter has been used as an observer, which has had a 30 milliseconds period. On the, right, on the left figure, is shown the mobile robot's position according to the GPS system. As it can be seen, the vehicle has followed a curved trajectory and then it has changed its trajectory due to the fault. This moment is marked with this red circle. On the right figure, the estimated fault magnitudes are shown. Here the fault is injected in the first actuator at the 16 seconds of the experiment and after that, the estimated fault magnitude of the first actuator converges near to the real magnitude of the fault at the first actuator, whereas the other two estimated fault magnitudes keep near to zero because in their respective actuators haven't occurred any fault. And for this reason, uh, default isolation and detection are achieved too because every estimated for magnitude is related to a specific system fault. And now, in this case, uh, simultaneous faults have, have been injected in the second and in the third actuator. As in the first case, here the vehicle has followed a curved trajectory and then the faults have occurred and as a result, the vehicle has, has changed its trajectory. Also, the estimated for magnitude of the second actuator converges near to the real magnitude of its respective uh, actuator. And the same behavior can be seen at the estimated for magnitude of the third actuator. It converges to its real, to its real uh, for magnitude. And I would like to remark that even though real data and a kinematic model have been used, good resources have been obtained where clearly a dynamic model would have had less and more dynamics than the kinematic model. And well, as conclusions, we have that the proposed scheme facilitates the designing process because it is just needed one observer instead of a bank of observers. The algorithm effectively diagnoses concurrent and no concurrent force. Uh, the proposed methodology has been successfully applied to a three-wheel and unidirectional mobile robot offline, and the methodology can be implemented with other observers, such as riding modes, etc. And as future work, we have that the algorithm will be implemented online on the omnidirectional mobile robot and the proposed scheme will be extended and applied to concurrent sensor faults. Well, that's all. Thank you all for listening. Thank you for the presentation, Adrian. Is there any question? Could you raise your hand if you have one? Or maybe you can open your microphone and ask the question. 
And no, there is no question. Okay, actually, how I have one question. Uh, in this approach, you are assuming that the faults are constant, they have a constant value. Uh, could, it, uh, could this approach be extended to the case when this, uh, these defaults are not constant, they are varying in time? How difficult uh, it would be? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, it could be uh, difficult because if you, we don't know the like the uh, time varying behavior of default. So if you know if you don't know that behavior, it's difficult to 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 try to moderate that behavior here. As you can see here, we assume that the since we are using observers, we we had to we have to have the information of the of the fault of the uh, we have the information of of his time varying behavior. I don't know if it is clear. Yeah, yeah, it's clear for me. Uh, is uh, there any questions? Another question? Uh, no. OK, thank you again for, uh, for the presentation and we are going to move to the next uh, presentation. Uh, the next. Uh, OK, thank you. Thank you. Again. Uh, the next work is titled Neural Analysis Mode Output Control, an application in, a, in an attitude for uh, quad rotor. Uh, who's going to be the speaker? Uh, do you hear me? I'm here. Yeah, sure. Okay. Do you see me? Yes, Scott. Okay. Uh, uh, good morning or good afternoon. It depends uh, if you hear. Uh, we present my my paper is with neuronal sliding mode output control application in attitude for quad rotor. Uh, the name of the author is it's me is is, is Abraham Rodriguez Mata. Uh, Co-authors is Aurelian Cabarjea, Rogelio Baray, Pablo Acosta, y, Rodri y Hector Rodriguez. We have work in in Tecnológico de Chihuahua. Yes, because. We live in the northern Mexico. Uh, we first. Uh, in advance, I uh, I pray sorry because my network is wrong. Please tell me is, if you see the delay on audio and video, please. Uh, my exp my exposition is is content. Uh, abstract introduction and simple model quadro rotor and neural output feedback is a slided control design, numerical results and conclusions. Uh, this paper we, we tried uh, this paper we try to study and the combination of three techniques of the automatic and control is is it's a like a combination of slided mode control, neural network and 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 a model a novel technique name and uh, filter high gain observer uh, we studied this application um to robust control and tracking control of the quadrotors uh, this is uh, this is not this is not this is uh, this is like a, this is at work Okay, uh, first introduction. Uh, the quadrotor robots have some tremendous expansion of this previous decade. Uh, the the reason of that is 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 because these robots uh, have uh, has many many applications, like agricultural servers, mapping and photographic, and border mass assessment and border integration, etc., etc., etc. In order to go, in order to to these applications, we have to ensure uh, an, an appropriate position, attitude, of control, and to complete applications. Uh, this type of, of control must be able to the windstone with gods because these these systems 
uh, are are many 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 sensibles and to disturbance and like and wind. Mm. Uh, here, here we have uh, on the diagram on the quadrirotor is the classical quadrirotor. In this quadrirotor, uh, you see you see the defect of the wind on the orientation model, and and this. And it is the reason that we have to design and robust control that uh, to uh, to uh, ensure the orientation of this problem. Uh, uh, the program for two call it sliding mode. We know that this sliding mode control is its many its main uh, techniques on nonlinear system. Typical discount techniques have a significant advantage in the robustness of nonlinear system in the presence of disturbance. Still, there are a lack of complete uh, knowledge on of the functions as such of the wind. This disturbance can, uh, can describe the fig damage, even causing real issues in the implementation, talent shattering. It's possible to improve this performance of the sledding mode control with of the use of the artificial intelligence technicals, such as neural networks, which with these tools have recently seen a boom in this application in control. The combination of neural networks with control by sledding mode Applied to rejection of disturbance in quadrilateral is very recent topic and to study. Currently, there are a few works in the robust control of quadrilaterals. In other hand, the factor high gain observer is a novel novel algorithm that they are begging students in recent papers. What is the reason that? Because uh, the filter high gain observer is and proven on the classical high gain observer that the that because the the classical high gain observer uh, has many 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 problems in presence and the signal with with noise and and white noise the filter high games improves this because uh, because this this estimated has has many performance in presence on the signal with noise. In this paper, I, I repeat, we combine we combined three techniques: uh, sliding mode control and neural networks and filter high gain observer to estimate the speed in the presence of, and noise of the output, and uh, an after to design a, a nonlinear high nonlinear robust control to quadrilateral. Yeah. Uh, you hear me? You hear me? Yes. Yes. Excuse me. Uh, excuse me. Uh, we have the the schema diagram of the robust control approach. We propose the combination of, of, of the two techniques and robust nonlinear control and robust. A filter high gain observer of RFE neural networks. This this application is using to the to, to design and um, reference number and um, reference nominal plan tracking to quadrilateral. Um, the first time we have to propose a um, simple model, uh, the model of the orientation of the quadrilateral robot is the next. Where G is the inertial matrix, C is the coloris matrix, UJT is the control output, and WT is the wind, the wind effect on this robot. Uh, we have to propose uh, four assumptions. The number one is is the inertial matrix is major to zero, is node. Assumption number two is the C is a Lipschitz state function. Assumption three is disturbance. Disturbance wind is unbounded, unbounded function vector, and 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 assumption four is the effect of the wind is differential constant uh, continuously and bounded, and and D is a 
is a una is a one function that is the plus and the wind and the color is effect. Uh, it's important to mention that since they are a nonlinear function D, such that the attitude angles are desacoplate, therefore it's possible to reject and uh, to reject the wind effect it at each angle independently. Okay, uh, therefore, based based on the above assumption, we we can to to propose this model, and with that, propose finally the canonical observability form of the system. This system is 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 a number four. This is the structure of the of the model. Okay, uh, with with above functions and and model, we can propose the the first the first filter Hagen observer. The first Hagen observer, I repeat, uh, is a very recent and novel theoretical and practical contribution. Is an unproven of the classical Hagen observers. Science is proves the previous problems of the Gaussian nodes in the outputs, which is generated by analogic digital sensors. This is a observer, the filter high gain observers. This is a nonlinear proposed. Um, we we have the the matrix key e, e the vector C, where the vector C is the filtering of the Signal output and KT and KT is is a part of solution on Riccati equation. If you can see the the stability test of this observer, please uh, see the literature. Number five is in in the in the paper. Okay, the the main part of this contribution is design of the neural lab sliding mode control with combination of filter high gain observer. The first the first time we have to propose on the sliding surface. This is this is this is in in, in equation number nine. The classical the classical problem is to revive this equation after we have to substitute in the system. After that we have the, the dynamics of the uh, din dynamics of the superficial surface we have this after that we have to propose a neural network to to estimate the out not part of the system this is uh, in the part in the in the term uh, in, in this term we have and, and we, this um, we have uh, the own system and disturbance part of the wind and the uncertain system, etc., etc., etc. We have in this part. Uh, uh, we use the the neural network to estimate this. Uh, therefore, we propose this control, this robust control. Uh, we have to say. Uh, 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 we have the sliding mode control. We have the estimate of neural network, and we use the filter high gain observer to estimate the the derivative of the error. We have here the the the, 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 the neural network that we propose on this paper, and um, and finally we have the main theorem. The main theorem basically says that uh, with this control and with 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 low adaptation of the neural network, we we have a stability of the quadrirotor. Is a classical proof of the Lyapunov equation. We propose we propose a classical function the Lyapunov function Lyapunov for adaptive control. There's the same the same philosophy. If we propose, if we 
we propose this adaptive um, neural networks and uh, uh, finally we have stability. The numerical results basically is 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 is, uh, is a like and seven seven iteratory. We propose um, this this external wind function. We propose uh, some some constant the control and the, and and propose this this filter this filter Hagen observer and we propose this control and we have the the next numerical results where uh, you can see the neural network can be estimate uh, so good the the disturbance of wind uh, you t you also see that the the systems uh, keeps the tracking control uh, we have here the signal control and the sliding surface and we have the signal the signal filter signals uh, in presence and white noise using the filter hygiene observer and the rebates conclusion uh, uh, as can be seen in the results the, the neural network uh, has a good performance in estimating the wind perturbation. The goal of this research was to investigate the robust control for quadrilateral helicopters orientation and adequate the combination of the principle of neural networks, sliding mods, and static feedback via high gain observer and while control separium criteria. This is my reference. Thank you so much, very much for attention, and we answer your questions. Thank you for the presentation, Aram. Uh, is there any question? Could you raise your, your hand, please? Please uh, write me the, the the question because I have I have problems with audio. Please. A problem with audio. Okay, it's not question. Um, well, I will try to to write it. Uh, Excuse me, excuse me. I don't know why. I don't know why. Uh -huh. No, don't no, no worry. Damn it. I think so are my speakers. I think so on the connection network. I don't know why, but I I hear you intermittent. Okay, I understand. Uh, you have a question in the chat. Maybe you can read it. Yes, yes, I can read it. Uh, the wind function is 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 an approximation. Is the literature model? Okay. It is it, very difficult and estimate the, the true function of this wind, but in the literature, in, in the literature exceeds uh, any functions that keeps uh, this, this, this function in the time and very good approximation. We using this, this model for to estimate the wind. Uh, in the future world, we have to use these techniques in realistic quadrilateral. We we have to this uh, in this moment. We have to to doing this experiment. Okay, thank you. Is there another another question? No. Okay. Thank you, Abraham, for the presentation. Thanks thank a lot. You. Thank you so much. Okay, then uh, we 
will uh, move to the next uh, presentation. We have time, so we can. We, we are not in a hurry. Uh, the next presentation is uh, the title of the next presentation is a systematic method for back, uh, stepping via linear matrix inequalities. This work is, is presented by well, is written by uh, Jorge Ibarra, Jesús Alonso Díaz, Raimundo Márquez, y Miguel Bernal. Uh, who's going to be the speaker of this uh, of this work? Could you write? Um, Jorge Ibarra. Jorge Ibarra. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, could you present your your yes, slides? I will show my camera. Is it fine? Um, okay. You look uh, very light <laughs> in this case. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you look very light, but we can see you. We can see the presentation. Is it yeah. fine? Also, we can see your presentation right now. OK, uh, I will start then. OK. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Jorge Barra, and I'll present a systematic method for backstamping by a linear matrix inequalities. Now, uh, the content of the presentation is the one that follows. I will uh, present the introduction, some preliminaries about backstepping and convex control, the main results of the paper, two examples, and the conclusions. Now, backstepping is one of the most generally nonlinear techniques as it keeps the nonlinearities in the final control law. However, it has some disadvantages. It relies on the designer's ability at each step of the procedure to develop or propose a valid diaponic function or control law that can stabilize the subsystem in under consideration. Now, uh, due to this and the nonlinear nature of the technique, some generalization, generalizations of this technique may involve scalar-only inputs at each time. On the other hand, convex modeling and convex optimization is, is known uh, for its systematicness and its numerical implementability. Some preliminaries about the backstepping technique. This technique exploits the cascade connection in nonlinear systems, as the one shown below here. Note that eta is a multivariable vector, while she and you are unidimensional, are scalars. Now, the functions f and g are nonlinear functions of adequate dimensions that are sufficiently smooth in a domain that contains the origin. Now, we will take this as the first subsystem. And we will take she as the, as the virtual control input. We will design a control law such that this first subsystem is asymptotically stable. Once we do this, we can rewrite the system with the change of variable shown here. And we, derivate, we find the derivative of theta and we reach this equivalent system. Once this is done, we can establish this system by considering u as the control input. And again, we need to design a control law such that the origin of this equivalent system um, is asymptotically stable. Now, for the LMI-based LMI control preliminaries, uh, this one consists in a complex rewriting of the nonlinear system, the use of a control law known as parallel distributed compensation from now on PDC and the use of the direct Lyapunov method. To illustrate this, consider this nonlinear system. <clears throat> we need to rewrite this system as this, factorizing the, the states. Then let's see be a selection of the different non-constant terms that are present in A and B. These matrices are non-linear. And we will rewrite them as a convex sum of their bounds, as we can see below here. Once this is done, we can do, we can do the following rewriting. We take the system and we rewrite it as, as this. This is possible because W 
are convex functions are are the product of the convex functions up here, as we can see below here. I is just the indexes of the convex functions that go between zero and one. And these new matrices that are inside the parentheses are just uh, constant matrices <clears throat> that are known as the vertices of the convex region. Now, we can consider a PDC control law as the one shown here in two, a non-linear, the control law, and will produce and it will produce the this closed loop system. Now we need, we need to find the gains that can stabilize this system. If we use the Lyapunov method, uh, we know that it states that we need to find a function that is positive definite, while its derivative is negative definite. We can use this candidate a quadratic Lyapunov function, and we can reach with this to these LMI conditions. If these LMI conditions are feasible, we can obtain the gains of the, of the previous uh, control law, the PDC control law, by making this operation below here. Now, our proposal says the following. At each step of the backstepping procedure, we need to rewrite the system that is under consideration into a convex form. Then, we will apply a PDC control law for the corresponding input, whether it's the final one or an intermediate one. Then we will use a quadratic Lyapunov function for determine the gains of the PDC control law via the LMIs shown in the previous slide. We repeat these three steps until we reach the final Lyapunov function and the final control law. This is obtained by means of recursion and nesting. Now, we can again consider this system in cascade connection, but now she and you are multivariable vectors. This is important. We can rewrite this system as we saw in the preliminaries as this one. And once we have this, we can rewrite it as a convex model like the one shown below here. Now, we need to establish this subsystem. We can do it by taking she as a fictitious control input. And this can be done, like we found the preliminaries, with a PDC control law, as the one shown below here. We just need to find the gains f. And once we do this, we can establish this subsystem. Now. Following the backstepping procedure, we can add and subtract this expression in the first subsystem. And if we define this change of variable, as we can see here, we can find the derivative of zeta, the one below here. And with this, we have an equivalent system. Once this is obtained, we can rewrite it as here, and we can build our convex model as the one shown here. Now, if we consider u as a control input of this system, we can use again a PDC control law, as the one shown here, that involves eta and zeta, and we can produce this closed loop system shown below here. We just need to find the gains f2 below here, and if we find it, we can establish this equivalent system, and consequently, we will stabilize the original system. Now, some examples. The first one is a single input system. In this form, we will take equation A as our first subsystem. We can rewrite it as uh, shown here, and we can choose these non-constant terms. Um, say I want to establish for the region of interest shown here. And with this information, we can we know that the bonds of the non-constant terms are the ones shown here. With this in, in, with that, and with all this information, we can construct the convex functions that are shown below here. Now, once the elements were programmed, uh, the results were the scalar shown here and these gains. And 
um, with this, we constructed the PDC control law and we use it to write this equivalent system below here, where theta is a change of variable as the one below here. <clears throat> now, we take this system and we will rewrite it in a convex form. So we need to establish, again, our region of interest, and we define the need, these non-constant terms with these bounds. With this information, we can put this convex function. And again, we need to <clears throat> we need to stabilize the system. Given this Lyapunov function candidate that now involves eta and zeta, uh, the LMI conditions yield these results. This matrix P2 and the gains F below here. With these gains and the ones found in the previous step, we can construct the final PDC control law. And once we develop the equation, finally we get this control law shown here in equation 10. Now, some comparison, some comparison between uh, both of the techniques are shown here. The, the proposal is shown in sol as solid lines and the traditional one is shown as dashed lines. Note that the proposal takes a little longer than, than the traditional one, uh, but if we see the control signals, we can see that the proposal takes way less effort to stabilize the system in comparison to the traditional one. Now, for the sample two, we have a scalar robot manipulator. This consists in two links with rotational joints. With rotational joints. The, the, the dynamical model is given by these equations. Note that chi and u are both multivariable like, vectors, excuse me. <laughs> and so this problem cannot be solved with ordinary backstepping because it can deal uh, can deal with MIMO plans. So if we repeat all the procedure again and apply the final PDC control law, we obtain these um, trajectories of the states only on the proposal because we can apply this to the ordinary backstepping technique. All the states go to zero as expected. And the control so, um, and the control signals uh, as well. They behave as we ex expected. So we reached to these conclusions: a systematic method for backstepping control be um, control design by LMIs can be reached by applying the convex control at each step of the backstepping procedure. The methodology has some advantage from the convex control area as we can, um, sorry, I hear some sound weird, mm. <clears throat> excuse me. Um, this methodology has some advantages from the convex control area as it can use some performance specifications like the decay rate, some constraints on the input or constraints in the output, uh, common things that happen in the um, convex optimization area. And finally, our proposal can deal with MIMO systems, while the traditional one cannot do it. Uh, this will be all for me. Uh, any questions? Yeah, thank you, thank you, Jorge, for the presentation. And um, as uh, Jorge said, is there any question? Could you raise your hand, please? No? Nobody has a question? Uh, Jorge, uh, I, am, I am thinking that I missed uh, some parts of your work because in the, um, the history of, the, of your approach is the following. You have several inter iterations where you are solving one step of the backstepping control uh, mm -hmm. using the LMAs, LMIs and uh, repeat it again and again. But in the very last iteration, you are solving with the LMI approach 
uh, a problem that has the same that dimension that the that the whole system, that the entire system. So, which is the real advent advantage of your of your approach, since you are solving several times um, several small problems, but at the end you are solving one problem that is uh, and this has the same dimension that the original one. Mm, yes, uh, that's a good question. Yes, um, the advantages uh, is that if we use LMIs at each step, we can use uh, some performance specifications from the LMIs. Uh, and if we use backstepping, we have the advantages of both. If we use backstepping, we keep all the nonlinearities at each step. And there's no only one way to, to section this system. We may have uh, a system with four or five uh, states, for example. We can boil it as, uh, we can take, for example, the first two as the first step. Then the next three as the first step, as the second step, or we can take the first one, then the second one, and, in terms of factibility from the LMIs, these results uh, may, dif may be different. For some, for maybe for the first one is uh, a condition is infeasible, but for the second way that we section the, the system, maybe it is feasible mm -hmm. with the same with the same conditions or maybe one of the one of the ways that we section this uh, system uh, allow us to use cer certain limits or use cer certain uh, decay rate and the other one can't because we, we can we could use la like you mentioned we could use two uh maybe always two steps or maybe all we can solve it in just one step we ignore the backstepping procedure and we use one step but maybe uh, if we use lemis in that case we can we can reach to a feasible um, to a feasible result or the result isn't as good as the one that we reach by using the backstepping control Okay, thank you. It, it has some advantages that we I, we can see very well in these examples. We, but yeah, is some of the some of the possible advantages that we can have when we separate the the system okay. and use that step. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, is there another question? Could you raise your hand? No? Okay, thank you, Jorge. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. I will um, stop presenting. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we have enough time. We have uh, five minutes. Okay, we are. Okay. Um, I think we can move to the next. Uh, Presentation is not uh, not that we deal with the time. So uh, the next presentation, uh, who, well, the next presentation is a disturbance observer based control scheme using an active disturbance rejection controller and under actuated mover crane example. Uh, who is going to be the next speaker? Is the speaker here? Yeah. No? Yes? Yeah. I'm going uh, to present. Uh, Mario Andres? Yeah. Okay. Then, Mario, you are from Simvestab also? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mario. Well, you can start now. Okay. Thank you very much. You can see my screen. 
And sure. Okay. So, hello everyone. My name is Mario Andres Aguilar Orduña. Fortunately, the presenter Brian Gomez has a power failure. So I'm going to present the paper title, a disturbance observer based control scheme using an active disturbance reaction controller and under actuated moving train example. I apologize in advance for my improvised presentation. Well, our work proposes the design of a disturbance observer based control from a reduced order extended state observer, active disturbance reaction control scheme. Then, taking advantage of the degree of freedom of the controller on the GW scheme, a full reduced order ADR controller is configured as feedback controller using its classical transfer function representation. This leads to a significant improvement on the disturbance estimation. Finally, this scheme will be tested on an underactuated, non-linear, non-feedback linearizable moving train. The first scheme is the reduced order ADRC. We can describe it in a few words as the one that uses a reduced order extended state observer and an estimate state feedback controller with disturbance cancellation. We start from a port order disturbed, disturbed system as presented in equation one. Some few assumptions need to be made. So, sorry, Mario. Uh, yeah? Some people are saying that uh, uh, they, they cannot hear you. Could you speak louder or maybe closer to you, to your microphone? Okay, sorry. Wait a minute, please. Sorry, by interruption. Better or no? Uh, no, I think so. No, it's, it's not. It's, I can't hear you. I'm going to speak louder. Okay, thank you. Is it better? For me, it's fine, yes. Okay. Um, you, you are seeing my presentation, right? Yes. Okay. okay. So we start from, from the fourth order system and some um, assumptions need to be made as noise free in the output, a known scalar gain named beta, and they bound sufficiently smooth unknown signal. Hi. Okay, we want to accomplish a trajectory tracking task of a smooth signal uh, Y star. We define the nominal control as that one that reached the main task of for an unperturbed system. If we define the error as presented, the error system can be obtained as shown in equation two. If we assume that the output velocity is measure, measurable, a reduced order extended state observer can be proposed as seen in equation three. From this, an estimation error dynamic can be obtained as presented in equation four. We can propose the set of lambdas variables such that the characteristic polynomial is Hurwitz. If we obtain the Laplace transform of the estimation error dynamic, a set of transfer functions can be calculated. The first three represents, this first three represents the state estimation error sensitivity transfer functions, and the last one represents the disturbance estimation error sensitivity function. Now, if we propose a control law from the estimated state and using a direct cancellation of the disturbance, and we close the loop, the sensitivity function presented in equation seven is obtained. Finally, a controller in transfer function form is obtained as presented in equation eight. This transfer function embedded the observer and the controller 
calculated previously, it's important to mention that the closed loop characteristic polynomial is obtained respecting the separation principle. Now, what happens if we consider a disturbance observer scheme? It's well known that the disturbance estimation is obtained from nine. However, previous work sh shows that the low pass filter L can be obtained from the estimation sensitivity function associated with the reduced order ADR scheme. If we reconsider the initial reduced order observer ADR scheme, it's clear that the disturbance to to estimate is, new, is a new disturbance. This disturbance is the residual of the estimated from the DOB scheme. According to this, the full estimation and the disturbance estimation error sensitivity function are defined in equations 12 and 13. If we take the magnitude plots of these both transfer functions, we can see a clearer improvement of the proposed scheme. We can see an accurate estimation of the disturbance, but it's clearer on the disturbance estimation error sensitivity function, where we can see an improvement on the disturbance attenuation, where the attenuation slope is twice with respect to the classical scheme. Now, we test this scheme on a non-trivial moving crane example. The main objective is to locate the nth effector of the mechanism on a desired position. We have initially as a control input, a torque tau as a horizontal force A. The nonlinear system is non-flat. So we take the linearized system around an operating point. This point is aligned to the vertical for the arm of the mechanism. The linearized system is controllable and has the presented structure. As the linearized system is controllable, a pair of flat outputs can be find, found. These flat outputs allow us to obtain the Brunovsky canonical form as seen in the equation 18. We could have applied the scheme at this point. However, to demonstrate the robustness of the scheme, we decide to replace these mechanical inputs by motors. So, considering the classical DC motor equations as presented on the left, it's possible to make a traditional neglection of the inductance which leads to a single differential equation. If we replace these dynamics into the Brunovsky canonical form, we obtain a new canonical presented in 19. Okay. From this final model, a reduced order ADR controller can be designed as seen in previous slides. For each subsystem, the characteristic polynomial, the product of both, controllers and observer polynomial respecting the separation principle. Just to mention, these are the parameters used to perform the, the following simulations. We have simulated the system pretending to move the nth effector from an initial position to a final position. Additionally, some exogenous disturbances shown in these graphs um, were included to, to disturb the, the system as shown in, the, in this equation. The simulation shows the results for a classical reduced order ADR controller and they mix it ADR plus DO, DO controller implemented on the nonlinear system. Apparently, there's no difference and both schemes accomplish the task proposed. However, if we now consider the tracking error signal and their corresponding integral square error criteria, a clearer improvement of the proposed scheme where significant reduction of the tracking error is obtained. Due to a better estimation, if we compare the magnitude of the ISE criteria for each output, 
the difference is, is even an order of magnitude. A final test on the scheme were made to see the robustness to the parameter variations. It's clear that the Brunowski canonical form, form depends on variables beta that will include parameters of the plant. We have changed simultaneously both beta gains in the range proposed, and we can see that the ISE criteria is still finite, which means that the tracking error tends to a minimal value to the trajectory tracking task is achieved. Finally, we present a small animation of the simulation performed We can see how the linear scheme is able to achieve the proposed task on the nonlinear system. I'm going to reproduce it again. Okay. Finally, to conclude this presentation, using a frequency domain analysis, we have shown that the DOB plus ADRC scheme exhibits robustness, robustness to input disturbances. We have shown that a clearer improvement is achieved with respect to a traditional DOB or ADR schemes. Via simulations, we tested the performance of the proposed scheme on a nonlinear MIMO, non feedback linearizable, and non trivial system. And some additional analysis were made of the effectiveness of the proposed controller to plant parameter variations. Thank you very much. Thank I you. hope you can hear the <laughs> presentation. Yeah, Fine. sure, sure. Finally, we hear it. Um, thank you, Mario. Uh, is there any question? Could you raise your hand, please? No? No question. Okay, uh, Mario, when yeah. you change the parameters beta, uh, you are changing, uh, these parameters are varying on time or for each simulation you consider one that is constant? Um, during the simulation is a constant value, it's but constant. we um, do a, a sweep of all betas um, without changing the, the design parameters of the controller and and the simulation just work well yeah yeah it's for that so they are constant they are not changing time during the simulation no. um i have another question also uh, it's about the control law is it too big or not because i i saw it in the graphic and the graphics but uh, it uh, don't say anything to me <laughs> i cannot see if it is uh, so big or what is normal, it's, uh, it's a good uh, value for the control load. In what simulation? Uh, in, the, in this, in the, in, for, for instance, in this one, that the control inputs or uh, varies from minus 150 to in the in the second graphics. Yes, the amplitude of these uh, signals is it big? Is it too big or not in the control in the, in the previous one? Are you in, in that? control inputs? Uh-huh, in that. Um, what is the question specifically, sorry? Are they too big or not, or, they, or are they normal? So is, is normal these values or not? Ah, okay, 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 sorry. Yes, it's normal. Um, here in the parameters, we can see that we have a mass M of 400, a, ma a M1 mass of 100 kilograms, so they okay. are <laughs> high values. They are in the range. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Is there another question? Raise your hand, please. If no. Okay, Mario. Thank you again for your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we have enough time, so I think at this moment we can wait uh, for nine minutes in order to start the next presentation, just to encompass all the all the presentations. So we will be back in eight minutes. Okay.
Are the next speakers in this room right now? Yes. The, the next one is, uh, which is your name, please? I cannot check. Dionisio? Yes, and Dionisio. Okay. And um, for the last uh, paper, who's going to be the speaker? Muhammad Imran Imran. No. Okay. Well, we will come back at uh, four twenty.
Okay, we continue with this session. The next uh, work will be presented by Dionisio Mesa Solano. Is that right? Yes. Okay, the, the, the work, the work is titled PID Control and Fusi Logic System to the Obstacle Avoidance, avoidance in Autonomous Robots. Okay, uh, Dionisio. You can start now. Could you present your slides? Okay, we see your slides right now. Okay. Uh, can you see uh, my presentation? Sure. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Dionisio Mesa, and the co-authors are Raúl Eusebio and Mariana N. Ibarra. We are from the Tecnológico Nacional de México, Campus Atlixco. And I am going to present the work entitled KD Control and Fossil Logic System to the Obstacle Avoidance in an Autonomous Robot. Introduction. Exist three basic functions in the robotics field. The perception, the, uh, the planning, and the action. And these are accepted and used in the combined to resolve different tasks like localization, exploration, mapping, path planning, and other. The robotic detection and obstacle avoidance application include aerial robots, aquatic robots, armed robots, and so on. Objective, and design and develop an obstacle avoidance system for a mobile robot in a controlled environment. And the environment in which the robot will move is a square of one meter for one meter with wet body ground bonded by 2.5 centimeters black line um, and 20 static objects are randomly placed on the surface. In this case, seven ounces red plastic glasses. And the robot design is based in a system of locomotion by two wheel center differential drive with a tier point of contact. And the entire structure was designed and built from zero. The robot has dimension of 12 centimeters long by 9 centimeters wide and height 10.5 centimeters. Uh, the figure 4A shows the distribution of seven year sensor um, separate 20 degrees from each other, covering a total perimeter of 120 degrees for obstacle detection. Uh, two other infrared sensor detects the white by ground located in the inferior part of the robot. The system is implemented in uh, ARM Cortex M4 STM32 A407 microcontroller, which executes MicroPython OS. The microcontroller is integrated in a developed port and that also has integrated a um, MPU65 tier national measurement unit. The figure two shows the block diagram of the system uh, proposed which acts as transducer. Uh, the FOSI system converts the sensor reading in a desired angle in degrees and obtaining the set point. The set point is the reference for the PID controller. This control will be in charge to direct in the robot towards the correct angle and also ensure that the robot response movement are gendered to set point change. Uh, the fossil logic system is responsible for detecting the obstacles and determining the direction and number of degrees of the adjustment that the robot moves to avoid an obstacle. And a weighting is assigned to each sensor according its position in degrees, minus 60, minus 40, minus 20, zero, and so respectively. And then equation one, the weighted average is calculated, where W sub R is the weighted average W sub i correspond to the assigned weighted uh, of, of each sensor and x sub i the sensor at are detecting and the result will be the central part of the detected obstacle and the weighted average is the input of Suheno Typhosis system or will determine the um, adjust in the position necessary to avoid the obstacle and this input has six membership functions, three for obstacle detection on the left and three for obstacle detection on the right. For the left side, three membership functions were defined. A spanning entries from minus 60 to zero degrees. 
the first function was named and left. In this case, the object obstructs a little on the left side. And the second function was named left. This case happens when an obstacle detected moderately for the left. Um, this membership function um, uh, were defined with a triangular shape. The third membership function uh, was named and left and happens when the robot detects an obstacle near the center but on the left side. This membership function was defined with a tra trapezoidal shape, so acts as values close to zero, which indicates that the object is even more in the center of the robot, that the sensor locates at and plus or minus 20 degrees, depending if it is the left or right side. And for the right side, the logic is the same as in the left side, but with the different name. And, uh, and, and right, right, I am right. And the FOSI system output is the desired angle, Terra FOSI. The output function are constant values that represent singleton type member team function for M left minus 20, for left minus 10, for L left minus 5, and so respectively. And the inference rules were defined so that when the robot detects an obstacle a little to the left, thrown a little to the right, and when the obstacle is a lot to the right, to the left, thrown a lot to the right. That is, the robot turns the opposite side on the one that detects the object, with when the same magnitude when the object was detected. Uh, the FOSI system defossification is executed with weighted average, and these output values correspond to the adjustment in degrees that is necessary to avoid the obstacle. Uh, the FOSI system acts when the sensor reading is different from zero, but, but are three cases in which the robot detects zero reading. In case one, the sensor does not detect obstacle, so the robot moves forward. In case two, one sensor detects an obstacle, and in case three, more that one sensor detects an obstacle. For both case, a flat was implemented to uh, remember the last position in which the obstacle was detected and to rotate in this direction to avoid the zero reading. Another important specification for the robot performance is that it should know what side um, the limit area by the black line. So to achieve these two possible cases were considered. The case one, when the robot does not detect obstacle, but it does detect the black line that delimits the track, either on the left or right side. When this occurs, the robot executes a turn of a loss into the return to the track. The case two, when by one side the black line is detected and the other uh, side an obstacle is detected. In this case, the robot moves backward until it no longer detects an um, obstacle and then turns toward the inside of the track. And to avoid obstacle, it's necessary for the robot not change direction, direction by executing movements that are not abrupt or oscillating to avoid undesired collision. For this reason, a PID controller was incorporated in order that the motor's movement mm -hmm. is with the last overshoot and error. The time function of the PID controller action is given by equation three, uh, where TE is the integration time and TD is the derivation time. Um, and they are defined by equation four, where K sub P is the proportional game, K sub I is the integral game, and K sub D is the derivative game. The rectangular approximation technique was applied to obtain the discrete time function, uh, resulting in the expression five. There, uh, t is the sampling period. Uh, in this work, the velocity algorithm is used to obtain the control action function. This algorithm ca calculates the increase of the control signal u times n where u times n minus one Excuse represents- me, wait a minute. Can you start again your presentation? Uh, I yeah. mean, show it again because some other presenter started showing. We're not seeing your presentation. Please share it again. Yes. Please do that, Don't you? Uh -huh. I can share, continue. Share your presentation again, please. 
someone okay. stop your presentation show. So please share again and continue. One moment. Let's see. Yes. Okay. Thank you. You can continue now. Okay. Um, um, the rectangular approximation techniques was applied to obtain the disk time function, resulting in the expression 5, where t is the sampling period. Um, in this work, the velocity algorithm is used to obtain the control action function. This algorithm calculates um, the increase of the control signal u times n, where u times n minus 1 represents the fusion u times n, the layer the unit of the sampling period. Substituting expression 5 and 7 in 6 gives an equation A. And solving for u times n from A, we obtain equation 9. And the constant k sub 1, k sub 2, and k sub 3 are calculated from the k sub p, k sub i, and k sub d gains, which uh, were calculated um, using the Sagler Nichols tuning. Um, and the sampling period t. The control action obtained from equation nine is used to calculate the durée cycle of the of a PWM signal that will control the motor motion. And to measure the output angle of this the control system, only the c-axis of the gyroscope is because the robot rotates around in this axis. The angular uh, velocity data from the gyroscope um, was read in degrees per second. To calculate the direction angle in degrees, the read data are integrated with respect to time and added to initial set point. And the discrete in integration time is represented by equation uh, 13. The, in the initial condition, the robot is positioned at zero degrees and start moving forward while maintaining that direction. Similarly, the set point um, initial is zero degrees, and this subdarin and each sampling instant n, uh, according to the adjustment provided by the FOSI system. From, uh, from set point times n, uh, error e times n is calculated the error correspond to the PID controller input. Mm -hmm. In each new set point, uh, the robot will continue advancing forward, maintaining the last referent angle. Uh, this video shows the behavior of the robot. We emphasize that the behavior of the robot is reactive. Uh, so it's move within its environment without following a defined path. Uh, the FOSI system was evaluated by testing that are determined uh, adjustment angle meet the objective of avoid, avoiding obstacle. In figure 12, the robot performance in front of an obstacle detected by the right side is observed. The robot turns toward the left side to be able to evade the obstacle. Uh, when the robot is trapped between an obstacle and the black line delimits, that the track, uh, the robot back and line the limits. The track, the robot goes uh, to back to evade the obstacle, announcing it no longer detect. The robot turns toward to the interior of the track to continue advancing. And this characteristic is shown in Figure uh, 13. Table one uh, present the average error calculate in 10 tests performance. And the mean of the error is 1.63 degrees, and the standard deviation of the error is 0 0.33. And this quantity is demonstrates the, the correct performance of the PID controller. The figure 14 presents the displays of the input, output, and error data during 40 seconds into validation test. 
Uh, additionally, five tests were de developed um, in which the proposed system was compared against a system that only implements positive logic and an on-off controller. The tests were performed uh, under the same condition for both systems. The execution time of each test was approximately one minute. The object that the robot was capable to avoid and the object that the robot was not able to avoid while moving freely in, in its environment were counted. The figure um, 50, 15 is the observation that both system on average collide, collide with a similar number of objects and therefore, in, term, in terms of efficiency, uh, there are no differences. Uh, however, according to the data in the figure 16, the previous conclusion is invalid because the um, fossil uh, logic system supplement with a PID controller um, avoids more obstacles when the robot was moving freely and uh, reactively throughout its environment, while the system of fossil logic and controller not was stuck in one area. Conclusions. The performance of the robot was evaluated in a series of 10 validation tests in which the mean error was 1.63 degrees and the error standard deviation was 0 0.3. And additionally, the proposed system was compared against a system that only implements fossil logic and on off control, providing that the proposed system is better to avoid obstacles. As future work is intended to integrate the object detection system to a navigation system that allows us uh, to reach the environment in specific areas and also avoid moving objects. This is my reference. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Dionisio, for the presentation. Uh, is there any question? Would you uh, raise your hand, please? Question? Okay. Uh, Dionisio, you compared your your uh, FOSI plus PID controller with a FOSI and on off controller. Uh, have you compared your uh, your proposal or your controller um, with a, another type of controllers that are also reported in the literature. Have you compared them or not? Sorry, no. I no. Don't know. Okay. Um, uh, there, are, there exist several controllers that avoid uh, obstacles also in the literature. Have you compared your controller, your proposal, with these other uh, approaches? Uh, no, so... Um, uh, and just that... Um, this uh, one. Only, only one, on off. Uh, only on off, okay. Okay. Uh, are you inviting uh, some advantage of your approach over all others, or, or you are just starting with this approach? Oh, no. Okay. Uh, is this your first uh, approach that you are doing, or you are you have more approaches? No. No. Okay, maybe we can talk uh, later. We, I want to contact you. Thank you, Dionisio. Thank you for your presentation. And we are going to move to the, to the next presentation. The next presentation is titled A Novel Method to Analyze Input Output Controllability. Uh, the authors uh, are uh, Mohamed. Abraham and Imran Hamed. Sorry by the pronunciation of these names are strange for me. And uh, the speaker will be Muhabet Ibrahim. Is that right? Yes, yes. Uh, you are absolutely right. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me and see my presentation? Yes, we can see and hear you. 
All right. So shall I start? Sure, please go ahead. Yeah, OK. So once again, hello, everybody. And um, the title of my presentation is to uh, analyze the input and output controllability of a plant model that uh, I chose. And um, first of all, I would like to uh, introduce the just uh, to brief the concept of uh, input output controllability. So myself is Mohammed Ibrahim and uh, I am actually a faculty member at University of Engineering and Technology uh, at Faisalabad campus. <coughs> So these are the uh, topics that I am going to cover in this uh, presentation. The first one, the motivation that brought me here doing this uh, research. The second is just a brief introduction about the input output controllability and uh, then something about the feedback control uh, and then how the controller was designed and uh, the, how the controllability analysis was done in order to get the results, for example, how the threshold was calculated, how it can be defined. OK, this plant is now controllable and this plant having this value, this much value is not controllable. So basically it is defined a threshold level was uh, analyzed and based on it, uh, I deduced the result uh, that the plant, a certain plant is controllable. So first of all, uh, which plant I am going to analyze uh, and what will be the variation in that plant, the process. Uh, there will be a, so different degrees of uh, multi input, multi output plants in which uh, the, there will be obviously a right half plane pole uh, because it will be an uh, unstable system is considered having a zero as well in the right half plane. So basically the presence of the right half plane zero limits the response and it slows the response and also produces an inverse response, uh, inverse step response. So basically these kinds of uh, uh, um, limitations are considered. Uh, first of all, the instability uh, and the second one is uh, uh, having a zero in the right half plane. So uh, the purpose is to the motivation is to find out how well a process can be controlled uh, based on that the my input signal, error signal and output signal. All these signals are within the boundary of plus minus one, right? So maximum value that the input output or error signal can attain is going to be considered as one maximum limitation, although in theoretically it can maybe it is possible to have is to control the plant having an input greater than one, but it cannot be said that this plant is going to be practically controllable. The only the plant is said to be controllable in a true sense if all the limitations, if all the boundaries of all the signals involved in a control process are less than one. <clears throat> All right, so which thing uh, decides that the plant is going to be controllable can be visualized uh, from a table that is given below, which means that the controllability matrix, actually the determinant of the Gramian controllability matrix was calculated and it was decided by the process that I presented before that if the Gramian controllability matrix determinant of that is greater than a th certain threshold value, then we could say that the plant is actually controllable. Otherwise, in the bottom two cases, we can say that the plant is not controllable because the reason is uh, that uh, either of the signals input, output or error uh, is going to be uh, greater than one or practically unrealizable. Uh, so the, uh, the motive another motivation behind carrying out this research was the straight controllability cannot may not imply that the system is controllable in a practical sense. Uh, as I told that to, it may possible that the uh, input that is 
the control input that is required to control the plant may not be practically realizable. <clears throat> so it basically predicts a very true uh, uh, value, a very true controllability, and uh, is it classical control theory cannot precisely predict the controllability. So first of all, input output controllability is also known as performance targeting, and uh, it is the ability to attain desirable control process. So this is made possible by constraining the magnitudes of the responses Y and control inputs Y, U. And the goal is to extract a threshold value based on the controllability characteristic according to a defined controllability criterion. Any value which would be less than the proposed threshold value would translate into the fact that the plant is not practically controllable. So this is a basic uh, block diagram about uh, just to give you a brief introduction about the feedback control. We already know that why in terms of complementary sensitivity function, T represents the complementary sensitivity function. Um, so and the control error is represented in terms of sensitivity function. Uh, the, the transfer function from reference to the error. So some general con um, formulas that are presented here, open loop transfer function is represented by the plant transfer function G and the controller transfer function. So the transfer function from reference to the uh, control input U is represented by KS. Right, so the sensitivity function in terms of loop transfer function is represented, which is identity matrix plus loop transfer function uh, inverse. Similarly, the complementary sensitivity function is represented in terms of loop transfer function. So talking about the H infinity controller design, as I uh, as we saw that the uh, sensitivity function was a transfer function from reference to error and KS represents the transfer function from the um, reference to the control input. So basically these two uh, transfer functions are considered in order to limit it, limitize the magnitudes in order to visualize the magnitudes uh, which having the value less than one. So the WP and WU represents the weighting factor uh, WP represents the performance um, uh, weightage and WU represents the input weightage. So in this method, a controller is synthesized by minimizing an H infinity performance objective the, and the selection of the appropriate weights in order to limit the magnitudes of the input and output signals. So basically the H infinity optimal controller is obtained for which the infinity norm of the stack matrix N based on mixed sensitivity specifications is minimized. So the variable uh, gamma minimum is the H infinity norm of the closed loop transfer functions S and KS that can be tolerated before the instability is reached. So the Meyer gamma minimum is required to be small as much as possible in order to achieve a better performance. The value will be smaller. It will represent a better uh, control on the other side. So this is the performance uh, weight um, in which uh, the weights are defined associated that which is basically associated with the sensitivity function and um, it amplifies the sensitivity function at low frequencies, giving them more uh, significance. Right, so the requirement is to have WPS should be less than one for all frequencies. 
so the above condition uh, so this condition states that the infinity norm of the product of uh, the performance weight and the mixed sensitivity uh, should be less than 1 for all frequencies but practically with a given controller the weighted function exceeds 1 at some frequencies due to the presence of right half plane zeros and right half plane poles similarly the input weight uh, is usually a high pass filter as you can see from the given equation because the actuator cannot handle high frequencies well or its wear is increased which results in the saturation of the input signal u now talk, coming to the controllability analysis of the plant different uh, multi input multi output plant models in which the transfer function contains uh, three uh, different poles uh, having values two poles are located at the value of minus 10 in the s plane and one right up plane is located um, at the position of uh, minus uh, sorry it, it will be varied along the region from for example from 4 to a certain point from 3.6 to 0.4 to 0.8 and then the right half plane zero will be varied from by varying different conditions for, for different by considering different cases for example varying it from the position of 3.6 to the value up to uh, the value of 4. So where R alpha represents the different levels of interactions with a step size of 6 degrees and then 12 degrees then 18 degrees and then up to 90 degrees so all these levels of interactions uh, were covered uh, in order to better visualize the uh, dynamics of the system that how is it going to behave uh, in the case when the alpha will be varied along with the values of the right half plane pole and right half plane zero. So once again, just to give the idea clearly once again that the controllability will be considered as good if the combined magnitude, for example, the peak magnitude of error, peak magnitude of the control input, peak magnitude of the output is going to be limit, limitized in the boundary of having a value less than one, then we could say that the uh, criteria is considered to be a represents a good controllability. So this is basically um, conjected with an AND operator in between. So once again, uh, the bad controllability represents the vice versa case. Any of these signals exceeds the magnitude of greater than one, then it is said to be a bad controllable uh, uh, version. For the, they are uh, accumulated with the OR uh, uh, sign. So these, this, these are uh, these. This table represents the angle alpha uh, from zero degrees onwards to ninety degrees with a step size, and in the second column, and in the second column. And in the second column represents the uh, controllability characteristic itself. So controllability characteristics, uh, the determinant of the Gramian controllability, you can see that the value starting from a very low value 0 0.094 and then going onwards 2.048. Then the angle phi has been uh, represented here, gamma minimum, the same function and that was the control objective and then the sensitivity function that was calculated that was required to be less than um, uh, one. So all these values were considered and the magnitudes, peak magnitudes of the control input U1, U2 and the errors and similarly the outputs were calculated and we could see that there are certain cases for which uh, the input, uh, uh, all the all the signals are going to be less than one. So 
from uh, this point where the controllability value is 1.197 in this case, when it is going to be greater than this value, then the combined inputs, uh, outputs and errors are going to be less than one. So before that, the output was greater than one and in some cases the error and output were uh, the, the having the magnitude of greater than one. So all the step responses were visualized for different uh, angles and in some cases the either one of them was greater than one or both of them uh, were greater than one. So we could see, analyze that uh, analyze that the, when the position of the right up plane was increased by a sum and of point 0.1, then the controllability was going to deteriorate. For example, in the first case, we could see that the value was 0.4, then the controllability characteristic was having a value of 0.116 onwards to 2.048. When the pole is going away, more away to the right hand side then the controllability was going to be decreased so as the plant is getting more and more unstable which makes totally sense that the plant is going to be more and more unstable then the controllability is going to be decreased so this uh, property is going to be reflected in this uh, controllability characteristic value similarly this can be visualized in the form of graph uh, in which uh, along the x-axis the angle alpha is covered in degrees and y-axis represents the uh, controllability characteristic value as the value is going to increase the controllability characteristic is going to be decreased as well. Similarly an opposite behavior was observed when a right half plane uh, zero was considered when the right half plane moves away uh, in the right hand uh, direction of the S plane increasing from 3.6 to the value of 4, the controllability um, characteristic is going to be improved. The reason is that why the controllability characteristic is going to be improved because the distance between the right half plane pole and right half plane 0 is going to be increased. So there is a certain um, relationship, that relationship came out from the analysis that uh, it must be uh, the right half plane zero must be greater than four times of uh, right half plane pole. So this was the uh, condition that was calculated during the research uh, and it was also presented in the paper that as the right half plane zero goes away and away and away from the pole then controllability is going to be improved. So this is has also been represented in the form of graph now coming to the value of the threshold value, it was analyzed that any plant, uh, so the, uh, the plant is said to be controllable if the threshold value is defined as 1.004. So you can see that in this graph, the combined magnitudes of all the input error and Y have been plotted along the Y axis and the uh, controllability characteristic is presented along the x-axis. So the left half portion, the left upper portion represents the uncontrollability region because either one of them is greater than one. Once the, or the magnitude of all these uh, signals slides below the magnitude of one, then we enter into the region of controllability region. So the intersection of these two dotted lines gives the value of the, um, the threshold value which comes out to be 1.004. This is the conclusion. Uh, significance of finding the Gramian controllability characteristic or threshold to precisely predict the input output controllability and it also motivates to quantify the limits of the variables and also it helped to evaluate a common threshold value for the Gramian controllability characteristics. Now the question arrives in our minds that is this threshold is going to be applicable to every plant model? Um, at the moment uh, uh, we could not say because uh, 
uh, this uh, uh, research can be brought uh, into a positive way as well to ensure that uh, that every uh, this threshold value will be admissible to every possible industrial control application so certainly there is a uh, prospect as well uh, which would we will look forward to in the future so these are the references which were put into this research and thank you very much for your attention thank you thank you for the presentation mohammed uh, is there any question please raise your hand okay no question a uh, uh, mohammed a uh, you are saying that you have a a precise uh, threshold you are finding in in the conclusion for instance you say yeah, that you find the precise uh, bound or the precise threshold that you need to decide if it is controllable or not. Um, is that true? Uh, in, in the meaning that if this uh, is the threshold is not uh, achieved, the, the, the band is not achieved, then the system is not controllable, at, at least not practically controllable or not? Yes, yes, of course. Uh, this is my claim that if the value is going to be increased by even a value of 0.5, then we could say easily say that the plant is not going to be controllable. The reason is that the, all the magnitude of U, error and Y were considered into the, our consideration. And then after that analysis, we concluded that, OK, this plant is not going to be practically controllable. It could be controllable in theory, but uh, in no, industry it cannot be possible. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Is there another question? No? Well, thank you again, Mohamed. Uh, this, is the, uh, this is the final presentation, so we are closing this session. Thank you to everyone for uh, attending this uh, session. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you to the speakers also.